Good morning, church. It's James, and I uh, hope you're doing well and have had a good week. It seems strange that I'm actually, it's Saturday, but I know that uh, you know that we record this the day before. Um, but uh, happy Father's Day. Um, and I'm extending my wishes to all the fathers who are watching this today. I hope you feel suitably spoiled on what for some is uh, a, an unusual uh, Father's Day because of the situation that we find ourselves regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. I recognise that a number of us will not be able to celebrate with our dads as we usually would. And also my heart reaches out to those in the church family, in my church family, who as you remember days like today, will be really missing your dads uh, who are no longer here. And um, I pray that whatever your circumstances are on, uh, on Father's Day, you will feel incredibly blessed by the relationship that we all can have with our Heavenly Father. Today we're continuing with the series on Acts. It's week five. Um, I want to thank the previous speakers who've been sharing uh, an insight into the early church and the journey that they're on. This week the, we're going to be exploring three chapters or three parts of, 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 of the following chapters, Acts 6, 7 and 8. It's quite a, quite a lot, but it's been really good to get in to this part of of, of this series and we're going to continue to move forward and I'd just like to say thank thank those speakers who've who've been sharing and giving us insight. This week the talk is entitled Church on the Move and I'm just going to pray that we're, uh, we're ready to, to, to hear what God want, wants to say. Father God thank you for your word and thank you that uh, you've given us this opportunity to just to, to take this moment in the busyness and uncertainty of, of, of situations that we find ourselves, just to anchor ourselves back into your word and to hear your voice. And I pray in Jesus' name for, for me this morning that you will help me to communicate clearly and, uh, and your message will be received through the words that I speak. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, so um, yeah, I just want to, uh, first of all, you know, like I said, it's been great to get into this series and, um, and, and to learn more about the early church in Acts. I just want to, to sort of really appreciate hearing Pete's talk last week and uh, it was really interesting and um, a couple of things that I really got out of, there was a couple of things, a couple of questions that Pete sort of posed and uh, in uh, as he was sharing his, his his talk last week and these were really sort of resonated with me um, and the questions were one why did the the writer choose to include this um, and we think about the multiple examples and experiences that Luke for example would have had and seen and been part of why did he choose to write these and include these stories in Acts. And then also something that always resonates with me and it was great to be reminded of, how is this story relevant to us today? So with this in mind, with these two questions in mind, let's have a look at the headlines that we can pick out because we've got Acts chapter six, Acts chapter seven, and the first few verses of Acts chapter eight. This is where we're going today. So some brief headlines. In Acts chapter six, we're seeing uh, in the New Living Translation, it calls rumblings of discontent. Things aren't quite working as smoothly as that uh, the church would have hoped. Growing pains, I call them. Um, but from this, what we see is 
and and I love you know I, I've re I've mentioned this before that God is a God of order God is a God of, of, of structure not that God wants to limit us through that structure and that order but God likes order because God wants to give us you know a pathway a route a, 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 a methodology for want of a better word not to limit us but to help us to like a father does to, to guide us along and so from this we see in chapter six some structure some order and some formal shape be, uh, being created around the church roles and responsibilities being delegated and um, and and thinking about that and, and then we see new new names emerging Stephen being one of them and then as we move through into chapter seven we meet Stephen and wow what uh, what a story what a what a person I've written down what a template of being a follower of Jesus is and throughout chapter 7 we encounter Stephen's life and he and he's like he demonstrates and I think this is not to be you know sometimes we put place these people in the Bible uh, on high pedestals and we wonder how would we ever get to that place I think what for me is one of the demonstrations for, for Stephen is he demonstrates what can happen when you grasp hold of the power of the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts, in the first three verses of Acts 8, we're introduced to this guy called Saul. We know that Saul becomes Paul and his connection to the persecution of the early church. As I said a couple of weeks ago, I love the detail that Luke, the, act, the writer, writer of the Acts, provides as he takes us on a journey with him through his writing. And it's an interesting point, and one that I've just literally picked up as I was studying these, these chapters over the last few days, is how important linking Saul and, and rever, you know, referring to Saul in, at the death of Stephen and how, for me, it gives us a glimpse of where Saul's life, the journey that he travelled on between that moment of encountering Stephen at, at, at his death, the martyr that Stephen was, to Paul's later conversion and how radical that change was in Paul's life. But also how important that Stephen's death acted as a catalyst in the life of the church okay so i want to take a, a, a for me today i want to take us take the opportunity to re reflect very much on stephen's life and we're going to do that by reading acts 6 um, verses 8 through into chapter 7 right on to verse 50 there's a lot of um, lot of verses here. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Okay, starting with uh, in Acts 6. So Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performing many miracles and signs among the people. Well, one day, some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, as it was called, started to debate with him. They were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Cilicia and the province of Asia. None of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. So they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen, saying, we heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. This roused the people, the elders and the teachers of the religious law. So they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council. The lying witnesses said, this man is always speaking against the holy temple and against the law of Moses. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the customs Moses handed down to us. At this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because his voice became as bright as an angel's. Going into chapter seven. Then the high priest said, ask Stephen, 
Are, there accu are these accusations true? This was Stephen's reply. Brothers and fathers, listen to me. Our glorious God appeared to our ancestor Abraham in Mesopotamia before he settled in Haran. God told him, leave your native land and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. So Abraham left the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran until his father died. Then God brought him here to the land where you now live. But God gave him no inheritance here, not even one square foot of land. God did promise, however, that eventually the whole land would belong to Abraham and his descendants, even though he had no children yet. God also told him that his descendants would live in a foreign land where they would be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. But I will punish them, punish the nation that enslaves them, said God. And in the end, they will come out and worship me here in this place. God also gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision at that time. So Abraham became the father of Isaac. He circumcised him and on the eighth day and the on the eighth day. And the practice was continued when Isaac became the father of Jacob. And when Jacob became the father of the 12 patriarchs of the Israelite nation. I'm just going to pause there because what we're seeing here is Stephen um, responding to those challenges that have been made against him. He's responding with an in-depth knowledge of Jewish and Hebrew scripture, Hebrew history. And I think it's really important that we understand that element of Stephen's life. Stephen goes on and, 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 and literally regales uh, 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 and re re responds through talking about the Jewish history and the lineage straight up to um, David. And we all know um, that Jesus family line came from David. What we do see as we come to those closing ends of Stephen's conversation with the Jewish established religion, frustration and irritation from them. And I'm going to pick up the story again in Acts chapter 7, verse 54. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation and they shook their fists at rage in it, at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honour at God's right hand. And he told them, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing in the place of honour at God's right hand. But they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. They rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at their feet. Laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees, shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that he died. Saul was one of the witnesses and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. A great wave of persecution began that day, <clears throat> excuse me, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem and all the believers except the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. <clears throat> a big passage of scripture <clears throat> with lots of information, but I feel that it's important to read as much as we can about Stephen's life and how his life acted as a turbocharger, I love that, a turbocharger for the church. And I want us just to consider this thinking about Saul slash Paul and his involvement right at that very end. 
So who was Stephen? Well, as we can see, he loved Jesus. Um, some history about him is that he was probably a freed slave and a member of the synagogue. As a slave, he would have probably risen to a responsible position and saved uh, uh, a considerable wealth to purchase his, his own freedom. And as we can see, he was a skilled debater, a man of considerable education, as is shown by his speech to the council, placing Jesus in his rightful place in Jewish history. And wow, what a speech. As we read from chapter in chapter seven, from verse two to 53, and I appreciate we have limited time, so I'm not going to go into the, all the detail. But I want us to approach Stephen's life from the question from this question, and that is how is his story relevant to us to it today? So as we break this story down into a few bite-sized pieces, let's think about this. Let's con consider these these things. What we see is through this the story of Stephen is yet another example from the early church of the power of the Holy Spirit at work. In verse 15 of chapter 6 we read At this point everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because his face became as bright as an angel. Thinking again about something that Pete said, and I paraphrase, uh, it, he, he mentioned about it all being in the detail. And I just want us to pick up on that detail in that verse about his face becoming as bright as an angel's. When I first read about this, his face being as bright as an angel, my immediate thought was seeing as, as angels in, in contemporary culture have become benevolent style characters who come to serve and protect us and fill us with peace. We tend to think of someone with a face like an angel as something as sweet and innocent. And this leads us to an assumption about Stephen. Now this is not necessary, although it's not very necessarily false, but the ancient concept of angels wasn't that they were docile or quiet. In fact, much completely the opposite. Angels in the Bible were more than likely to be sent as witnesses and send their witnesses, so people receiving and seeing them, to their knees in terror. I mean we read in Matthew 28 5, Luke 1 11, and uh, Acts 10, Luke 13, virtually every person in scripture who sees an angel immediately has been told not to be afraid. We see in Daniel that he fell to his face in fear when an angel visited. So I feel that that reference that Luke makes to, to, to what Stephen's face looked like is very different when we think about angels. In short, I feel that angels are massively powerful warriors in God's army and not chubby infants with wings sitting on clouds and playing cute harps. To say Stephen's face reminded his audience of an angel speaks more of the evidence of God's power in his life than anything else. And then moving on, Stephen is clearly not defenseless either. He is filled with the Holy Spirit. He's speaking, boldly speaking words of truth that his adversaries are powerless to, to come against. He certainly knew about Jewish history and Jewish scriptures. And as we read his, this blow by blow account of this encounter between Stephen and the established church, established religion, he provides a whistle stop tour from Abraham to why Jesus is the Messiah and should firmly be part of Jewish history. Why is this, why is knowing these Jewish scriptures so important? Well, if you look at the audience that he is making his speech to, to make an impact, to keep their attention, to catch their attention, Stephen had to speak their language. He needed to have a credible voice and he needed to know his subject matter. 
And then Stephen had the courage of his convictions to enter into this debate, irrespective of the outcome. He was defending something that he absolutely believed in. I think he would have been aware that he was likely to have trouble from the religious establishment by speaking out this way. He would have been aware of the trouble that Peter and John had got into after they healed that lame man back in chapter 4. Stephen had the confidence to do what he believed was right, even though other people were unlikely to agree or approve. And as we read in, 50, in, in verse 54 onwards, his convictions of speaking the truth resulted in him dying a hideous death. Stephen was the first Christian martyr. And it was this point that acted as that turbocharging moment for for the church. His death will give his enemies the courage to pursue, persecute other ch Christian ch Jesus followers, as we read in Acts 8 verses 1 to 3. But as the, but, but, but as the, the members of the church flee Jerusalem, it doesn't end there. In fact, it grows from that moment. They, these followers who flee from Jerusalem then take Jesus' message with them. And then 2,000 later, Jesus' followers, full of the spirit of wisdom, will continue to spread Jesus' Jesus message around the world at, at no matter the cost. So back to this question, how is this story relevant for you and I today? For me, as I answer this question I reflect on how well Stephen knew his scriptures and this has left me considering how well do I know them? Do I spend time learning and grabbing hold of the scriptures so that when the time comes I too could speak with a credible voice like Stephen? And then it moves me into that thought around courage of one's convictions. In the last few months we've seen some amazing scenes across the news where people have taken hold of the courage of their convictions. They've been willing to speak up and take a stand irrespective of the personal outcome. Some examples that I immediately think of is NHS and care home staff going that extra mile, placing themselves at risk to ensure that the sick and dying had dignity and comfort during this pandemic. I've been personally challenged by the shift in how these folk have provided a, a clearer template of what it means to be human. And then in the last few weeks, we've seen this movement, this Black Lives Matters movement, that is making a stand for the injustices of racism and inequality, and saying with authority that it is not right. And not just saying it, but being willing to stand up and be counted to defend their stance and their views and against these injustices. And then, you know, we also uh, see young voices being raised up. Greta Thunberg creating a movement of young people raising their voices. Again, not, not without knowledge, but with knowledge and understanding of their subject matter so that you can speak with authority and this movement of young people raising their voices to turn the tide on climate change. Those are just some examples that I've seen in the news. And as we know, church history is filled with people like Stephen acting as a catalyst of change because they were willing to defend what they believed in, speak up and act in order for Jesus to be revealed. So as I come to a conclusion, folks, and as we continue to move forward as a church family, 
I'm not sure whether we've all been called to be physical martyrs like Stephen. Although when we do stand up for something that we believe in, it is likely to cost us something. And that cost could be time and effort and energy. It could be friends, it could be family, or it could be even your work situation. In essence, I see this passage and the life of Stephen and his example being relevant for, relevant for me, and maybe this will resonate with you too, that we must be ready and prepared for a Holy Spirit moment to defend something we strongly believe in. And to do this with wisdom and grace, trusting that our actions, whether they are spoken words or help or helping hand, will act as a catalyst for change. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your Bible. Thank you for how your words in your book change and shape us. Help me and each one of us to get deeper into your word so that we can learn more about your character. Thank you for the example of Stephen. It's been great to learn more about him and be encouraged by the people you call your followers. Lord, I pray now in Jesus name that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you will help me to grow in wisdom and grace. Lord, we all desire to be catalysts of change, seeing lives transformed as they hear more about the wonderful Father our wonderful Father. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week, folks. Look forward to catching up with you on a Zoom call. Um, I'm going to say it's later today, but you know I'm recording this Saturday, so it'll be tomorrow. And uh, be blessed. Have a great week. See you soon. Bye.